Welcome everybody. This is the SharePoint Community Call. It is November 2020 edition, November 10th. Um, the next community call is already in December, so Christmas and holiday season is coming really, really fast. So it's pretty cool. And time flies when you're having fun. Now, uh, today uh, we will have uh, kind of a typical setup on the monthly community call. So we'll walk through uh, some of the latest news, monthly summary and other details, not a massive amount of actually content over there. Um, and then acknowledgement of the community contributors in the past month. So people who contributed in the open source, not just in SharePoint, but across the Microsoft 365 so in the docs or in the samples and all of that. And then uh, we'll have a optional picture time. Um, unfortunately, I think we still have the together mode limit in 49 people or 50 people. So let's see who are the ones who will get to the picture at this time. Uh, when I'm getting there, you can actually enable the video at this point already if you want, but hey, it's up to you. I'm, I'm actually keeping it down uh, for reducing bandwidth from my side. And then the main topic today, like 15 past, 20 past, will be uh, getting started with SharePoint Syntax uh, and Sean Squires, uh, who is a principal program manager from Microsoft owning this capability, uh, will be presenting that. So that will be like 15 minutes or 20 minutes uh, on the call. But let's actually get moving uh, on the slides. So a few uh, kind of a standard slides, which we always go through in this call, just making sure that everybody is up to date on different assets and capabilities and stories and links and all of that stuff. So we do have two different YouTube channels. We have the Microsoft 365 Developer YouTube uh, video channel, which is only for developers content. And then we have our Microsoft 365 Community Videos channel, where we also have non-development content. So pretty recently, actually, we set up and, and published a set of nine videos, which is around the more modern intranet uh, and how to build up a modern intranet. It's actually talking also adaption and how to get people out, but it's the change management and all of that. So a pretty cool setup of videos as well. Then in the open source side of the house, there's multiple different organizations where you can find content and samples and guidance and tools and all of that stuff, and you can contribute in all of them. We do have sample galleries right now. We have four different sample galleries where you can go and find, for example, samples related on Microsoft Teams or SPFX or list formatting which is, by the way, one of the most um, more popular sample galleries. Uh, pretty soon, or later this year, we're looking into potentially have a one unified Microsoft 365 sample gallery where you can go and find all of the relevant stuff for you, regardless what technology is being used. And then if you're wondering, oh, there's too many URLs, I can't handle this, too much pressure, help me, help me, help me. Luckily, there's only one URL to remember, which is the AKMS M365 BMP, which is Microsoft 365 Patterns and Practices. From that location, you'll find links to all of the other assets and so it will be super easy to remember. Now, uh, since this is the SharePoint uh, monthly community call, um, we are having two different user voice entries. I'm just going to pinpoint here a few user voice entries uh, from the non-development side of the house. There's, this is the top 10 right now and, and number one there with massive amount of words is, is to enable a renaming of SharePoint tenant domain and this is something I can I, don't, I want to say so much, but I can't say too much, but we are actively working on this one. Uh, so um, you, we are actively working on a, on a model where if you at some point were accidentally registering a SharePoint Online tenant, which wasn't super optimal for your company, you can and we will allow you to change that. Now, I can't give you an ETA on that one right now uh, because we don't want, I don't want to eat thunder from the people who are actually introducing that, but it's being actively worked on. All of the other stuff uh, is, is actively being worked on and prioritized as well. So please keep on the votes coming. On the development side and extensibility side of the SharePoint house uh, is uh, the number one is, is really the overriding of, of the custom forms. And this is getting more and more votes all the time. So people just want to basically override a custom list or a library editing experience using SPFX. And we absolutely acknowledge uh, the capability. This is more or less waiting for resources and prioritization uh, to get that one actually moving as well. So we do know that we need to get it that, uh, done as sooner or later, but again, no ETA on that one at this point. 
other than that, many of the capabilities which are being requested are well known. Just to pinpoint actually one thing which is there is the live persona card. This is the, the live card where you hover on top of a user and then it shows information and for example documents which the user has actually done. That's the one thing which the Microsoft Craft Toolkit team is currently being worked on. So you can relatively easily actually uh, implement that kind of functionality for your SharePoint framework solution relatively soon. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Now, uh, the other thing uh, which we obviously always promote is the open source and community side of the house. And it, you might every now and then feel slightly threatened or not comfortable about this stuff. And that's why we have the AKMS Sharing is Caring initiative. And I think, David, you will be the right person to quickly do an intro on this one. What is this all about? Absolutely. Thank you, Vesa. Well, as we're going to see in a few slides, we have had an amazing collection of contributors in the last month. Now, these are not personally specifically hand-selected contributors that we know are only the ones that can contribute. They are anyone and everyone that has shown interest and willingness to contribute. Patterns and Practices is an open source and inclusive community, but we know that there are times when this can be a little intimidating. There's a fear factor of the unknown and working with uh, tools like GitHub that you may not have ever worked with in the past. Sharing is Caring is here to provide hands-on guidance sessions that will walk you through in a group-like fashion together, step-by-step step, to understand how to do some things like your first-time contribution, contributing to community docs, which means you do not have to be a de developer at all. There are absolutely opportunities for the non-dev. And also we understand that using some of the tools within the PNP community, such as the samples, can come with a degree of confusion and frustration if you're not sure how to manage things like Node or the versions of SPFX, et cetera. So we've got a lot of sessions. As you can see, there are three identified on the screen, all free, all uh, uh, available for you to register for and join. Please join Hugo and I. We, we uh, run it and Hugo is the much be be better looking one. So uh, you'll, you'll enjoy working with him. But uh, free to join, completely open source and available for you. Uh, we've got more coming with a multi-day session uh, coming up at the end of this month. We'll have some information on that in the next few days. So aka.ms forward slash sharing is caring. Please go there and register for some of the uh, available sessions. All right, thank you. Back to you, Vesa. Excellent. Thank you, David, on that one. So really, really there to help you. And like David said, this is fully inclusive. Don't feel afraid. Uh, we want everybody to be able to contribute and we want everybody to, to be, we want to teach everybody how to get started on contributing in open source. So please get involved. And, and these sessions are getting extremely good feedback. Let's put it this way. So thank you, David and Hugo for running that show. Now, one thing I wanted to just pinpoint as well, if you're trying to keep up to date on all of the latest news and articles and all of that's what's happening in the Microsoft 365 platform side, we do uh, publish a weekly show, which is the Microsoft 365 PMP Weekly. It's me and together with Waldeck MasterCards, who is a cloud advocate in the Microsoft. And then we typically have a visitor in the show. And uh, the latest version and latest, latest uh, setup was actually going live earlier today with Cameron Trier, who is the CTO in the one, one spot solution. I'm probably remembering the name in the wrong way. I do apologize, Cameron, on that one. Um, but it's a good, a good discussion related on why their company has invested on a Microsoft 365 platform and what is the opportunity for companies on actually going there. So if you are an ISV or a system integrator, why the Microsoft 365 is an interesting platform. But every single week we have a slightly different discussion and slightly different topics. The other really cool podcast show is the Microsoft 365 developer podcast, uh, which is hosted by Jeremy Fake and Paul Scheffelin. So if you're more interested only on the development topics and don't want to hear anything else than the development development topics, this is more uh, potentially for you. But obviously, we encourage you to subscribe on both of them. Uh, this one is only available in the podcast format and the PMP Weekly in a video and a podcast format as well. Now, the monthly summary uh, of the, uh, which we always release, and we've been doing this since 2014, which means six years, which is actually quite wild, uh, is going to go live uh, tomorrow. This is still pending a few updates from my side, so we will actually get a full list of people and companies and, and all of the changes which has happened within the open source and in the, in the documentation side. 
But obviously, we already know who are the people who contributed. So, and there's a once again, there's a massive list of people who've been actively involved, contributing in our samples, documentation, open source tooling, SDKs, and all of that stuff. And and we seriously want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being involved, helping other ones, uh, other people in the community uh, to succeed as well, and building tooling and SDKs together rather than sharing our uh, or dividing our time in multiple different projects and the whole thinking is that we build stuff together so that everybody can benefit out of that and that means that everybody can be succeeding more easily and this is the list of people from a to j a to t and um, so a lot of people in here and i i kept the, the dividing in two pages and this is the list of people who contributed external people who contributed from k to y so a lot of people, thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of this community. Now, we also have a quite a big list of companies who have allowed us to use their logo from the people who contributed. So if you have contributed and you would be fine to show your company logo in our messaging, just kind of a, a credits for your company as well, uh, please send the logo for us and give us a permission that we're able to use that. This is the group of companies who allow their employees to contribute to our open source efforts. So thank you, thank you for that as well. And on the Microsoft side of the house, there's quite a few Microsoft employees who've been actively involved as well. So not forgetting about internal community, there are TSPs and BFEs and customer engineers who are actively contributing and using their own time for the benefit of our external community. So thank you, thank you as well. Now, let's actually get to the one of the most important things in this call, which is the picture time. So, before we go to the go to the SharePoint syntax, for those who are willing, we can do a quick to get a picture. I will share my to get a picture mode in a second. I still do not have, unfortunately, the the different options. I probably should have investigated that. How do I actually get the preview pictures and let's see when this one actually starts showing people in the right format there we go there we go that's a good start i saw already that there's multiple other people as well and i'm not even there so there we go now it starts expanding i think we have a limit of 49 which is roughly that one. So I do apologize if you missed it. It's always the timing on how when do you actually enable the video. Should we try to do a wave? I think that's impossible. So just kidding, because there's no way of knowing <laughs> where inside you are. <laughs> but let's wave everybody. I will take few pictures of this one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for volunteering on, on doing a picture as well. Thank you for being part of the community. Uh, really, really cool uh, to see the actual faces because sitting in front of the monitors is so different than, than seeing you people in the conferences. So thank you, thank you for that one. Good, that's it for now. So thank you, Seb, for a funny face as well. I can see you on the middle. Now, uh, <laughs> let's actually get back on the slides. So thank you for that one. I will share some pictures in a second in the chat, and then we are ready to go to the main star of today, who is, the one and only Sun Squares. John, I saw you on the call. <laughs> Good morning, Basak. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Happy Good to be morning. here. Yeah, <laughs> good to have you in the call. I think everybody's waiting to get the latest on SharePoint Syntax. What is Syntax? What does it actually what mean? What is Syntax? Yes. Uh, thank you for the time and uh, happy to share with you what I've been spending, gosh, the last year and a half working on. So, um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, let's do this. I'm going to turn off video just because, but I am here. Hello. And yep. let's share the screen. So I'm going to throw a bunch of information at you guys, and then we're going to, um, you know, demo as much as we can uh, in the time that we have together this morning. But just wanted to take some time to you know, share with you what Syntex is, what happened to Project Cortex, what's going on. <laughs> so I uh, thought it'd be helpful not knowing where everybody is in their journey learning about this new product add-on uh, to just give you some framing and help you understand where this sits in the broader what is now we kind of refer and refer to internally as the uh, Project Cortex initiative because the evolution of it really has been 
we were working on what initially was going to be just one larger product. And then that's gone through a couple of iterations and evolutions. And while there'll be a lot of connection between the various pieces that the uh, larger team is working on, they really started to evolve uh, a very different set of capabilities that while they complemented one another, uh, were also targeting different use cases and in some cases different uh, members of an organization. And so Syntax is really around, you know, focusing on the content services space and how we can evolve that, and how we can build on what's already a world-class content services product with SharePoint, which we all, you know, use and love, and how we can make, do more with it. Um, thing we continue to hear from you guys and our TAP customers and at conferences is just the challenge of, you know, with all the data that we're trying to manage in our SharePoint tenants uh, and libraries and just, you know, taking advantage of all the content management capabilities that we provide there with, you know, with uh, libraries and with library views and content types and taking advantage of managed metadata, that it's still hard, you know, to make sure that things are, uh, a, tagged at all, but also consistently tagged. And that metadata is really such a cornerstone of a really rock solid content management system because it can really help in so many ways. You know, uh, a lot of how we look at it, I, I always refer to like these sort of three solution pillars. You know, you have good metadata, it's going to help in your search retrieval. It's going to help with your downstream business processes. You know, once you have that metadata, you can do something with Power Automate, let's say, to orchestrate some type of automated flow. And then, of course, with content governance, you know, we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years working really closely with the security and compliance folks to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're tying into the information protection experience. And we saw opportunities there to kind of automate that for consistency and to make it happen faster. So really excited about some of that work, which I'll talk about in a second. And the other thing, too, is that we, we commissioned a study uh, during this last year while we were working on this and really just saw a lot of not just the pain points that uh, folks like you were reporting to us, but also just the opportunity to really optimize uh, savings, honestly, you know, move people to higher productivity saving, you know, get productivity savings and move people on to higher tasks because let's admit it, none of us like to manually tag metadata and files that we're, we're hosting. So we saw opportunities to really move into that space. And so where Cortex really started was we were looking at sort of across the spectrum and I, I wanted to bring up this slide real quick just to kind of show how the evolution, well, not the evolution, but what kind of where we're at at the moment is Project Cortex kind of, we now have two separate products. We have like sort of the knowledge curation discovery. This is uh, the work that you've heard us talk about at conferences. And this is where we mine your existing content to help make connections and identify topics and connect uh, experts with the content. And then you can curate that. Uh, and that really helps build up that uh, knowledge base. The other side of it is the syntax side where you have all that content. How can we help you with AI to better organize that information? And so it's a little bit more intentional, a little bit more human first. And really where that uh, landed was just, how can we give you an easy way to build AI app capabilities to better uh, automate the classification of your content and the extraction of metadata from that? So when we think about syntax, we look at it in kind of a couple of different um, uh, views, but really it boils down to, in addition to kind of like that search and business automation and compliance is really just that. How can we help you classify it, find the content, classify it, and then extract the metadata from it? And then with that metadata, you can then start to do wonderful things uh, with it. And so a lot of the capability was how do we start to really build and provide you with those great um, uh AI app integrations to make that happen. And one of the sort of breakthrough here, breakthrough opportunities here with Syntax is that, um, you know, the, our, our AI teams have just been building some very innovative uh, uh, AI capabilities that we have integrated into the product. And I just point, point, point this out because this is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, traditional machine learning, it, it, it's, it's very powerful, but it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of training. It's typically a bit opaque. You know, you need typically large training sets and you have to label a bunch of stuff and then kind of let the system chew on it for a while. And then you have to review the results. And it's it's sort of a, a bit more laborious uh, 
back and forth labeling effort to get the model to a place where you where it's doing what you need it to do. And what we do with Syntex is we're taking advantage of a technique in AI called machine teaching. And what's powerful about this is it kind of puts the human uh, first and at the center of the equation and allows you to work with a smaller sample set, do a limited amount of labeling, and then review those results more real time. And in, in effect, kind of shorten that, um, that training process and get to a point where you can go, great, I can now very quickly and easily train a model to uh, understand that this is a contract and this is not. And once I have that contract, then do some additional training to say, I want you to identify, identify certain entities uh, from that contract and then write that stuff out to, uh, uh, to a SharePoint library. And so just to kind of put this, this in frame, because you've all probably also heard if you've attended, uh, listened to any of the talks, I was going to say attended, we have all been in quarantine for too long. So <laughs> listen to any of the talks that we have given in the last year. Um, there, there's, we kind of see this as a bit of a spectrum, and there's different uh, capabilities that we provide in this release of Syntex. Obviously, on the far left, you have just sort of what we have today, you know, the manual ability, you know, to uh, uh, leverage uh, metadata and tag content and, you know, set up content types and all that. And I will just use that opportunity to make a plug that as a part of this effort, as many of you know, we really doubled down and reinvesting in the managed metadata service. And a lot of that work has gone out uh, already and is available to you. Uh, there are some additional enhancements. We're going to continue to uh, build on the managed metadata service and invest there. And some of those investments are reflected in the, the Syntax product, uh, but there will be also additional you know, improvements made uh, to the service itself. Um, moving down to the right real quickly, uh, there's we're also looking at uh, taking advantage of some of the AI work that we've been doing internally to just sort of automatically detect things and automatically tag things. And so our first foray into this, uh, which will be coming out later this year, is object detection. So this will be the ability to take things like image files and automatically detect objects uh, in those files and effectively uh, uh, write those out as tags. And so you can pretty much do that with, you know, that's a little bit more black box. That's largely just taking advantage of these sort of pre-built, pre-trained models. And you're just essentially lighting them up um, uh, and in this case, they're detecting image files. We're looking at incorporating, extending that to, uh, you know, just more text analytics, where imagine just being able to upload a document and have it automatically extract key phrases uh, using the Azure uh, Cognitive Service APIs. And so that's work that's uh, still in development, but certainly a really neat area when you don't need to do a bunch of customization. You just need to get some tags out to maybe improve search or at least just to you know, uh, drive some general processes without a lot of customization. But if you have specific customizations or specific entities that you want to extract from your documents, then it's best to, you know, uh, go into the custom space. And that's really where Syntex shines. And just to be clear, we provide two different technologies here. Um, th these are using two different underlying AI APIs. The first one is uh, form processing. And the form processing, quite simply, is using the form recognizer API that's been uh, uh, integrated into AI Builder, which is a new power platform service. And so what you can do is we've built, we've partnered with them and built an experience with Syntex that essentially lights up an option to allow you on a library to initiate a form processing uh, training exercise in AI Builder and build that model and then apply that model directly to that library. And what we do is we do all the heavy lifting for you in terms of, uh, you know, as you train the model, then what we're going to do is take that model, we're going to, you know, put it into a Power Automate flow, write everything back to the library, do all the setup for you. So it's a pretty seamless experience. And when you're done, your model is ready to go. The document understanding ones, those are built on uh, some different technology. For those of you who are familiar with the work that we've been doing in the AI space, this is working off of uh, the Lewis uh, APIs. And what this is doing is this is more uh, tightly integrated into SharePoint. And this allows you to build models in a new site template called the Content Center. And with that, and I'll show you that in a second. And what you can do with that Content Center is we provide a training experience that allows you to effectively build these models. And these are a little bit different because they're being centrally created and managed in the Content Center. The difference here is that these models can be applied to multiple libraries. So, or, and they can also be uh, reused. You know, you can apply multiple ones to the same library. So they have a little bit more flexibility 
right now in their usage. Um, and then the difference between the two is how, what kind of content um, <clears throat> you're needing to classify and extract information from. And we, we recognize that this is a bit of a, a cognitive load and you might say, well, Sean, I need to do something that's right in the middle. <laughs> and we are aware of that and we're working to, you know, uh, kind of fill that gap. But right, right now we really want to make sure that we were giving you guys options and giving you that flexibility to tackle and address and build models on these different types of content. And so you'll see there on the left with the document understanding, it's it really, again, built in the content center. Um, and this is great for unstructured file formats. So, you know, office files, PDF, things where you have uh, a lot of just text, but you have some consistency. Like in that case, you'll see uh, that service agreement. So if you've got like a, a contract that has a lot of text and you want to extract information from that, like maybe the, uh, you know, the start date or what the, uh, you know, who the vendor is or what the uh, terms of uh, agreement are, you can be, you can extract those clauses uh, because they're sort of like, you know, uh, loosely, you know, found in the paragraphs themselves. Whereas the form processing, you know, using the form recognizer API in AI Builder, that one's a little bit more structured. That one's better for, you know, digital forms and invoices, things where you have a real clear, more structured format where you have a clear key value pair. And what you want to do is say, hey, I want to pull the uh, date value out of the date field in this purchase order or get the total out of the uh, of the invoice. And that one is uh, um, and that one works specifically on PDFs and JPEGs and PNGs. There's uh, uh, if so you can scan you can you can use scanned files uh, to train those models. People have asked about what what the timeline is for uh, support for, say, uh, Word and other types of office formats there. And it's things that the uh, AI Builder team is is looking at, uh, but not available yet at this time. So given the fact that these are like two different experiences, we did try to make them, you know, as coherent as, you know, and aligned as possible in terms of the experience. The, the actual UX is very different, but the, uh, the, I, the intent is the same. You know, you effectively have to uh, either go to the library where you want to train and make the model in the case of form processing or go to the content center experience and then go through a model training exercise. And they're both very similar in that regard where you're again working on a very small set of files. In the case of form processing, for those of you who haven't tried that out, probably won't have time to demo that fully today. But the idea there is you know similar in that you use a small set of files and what the system is going to do is it's going to analyze those files and then it's going to identify specific information. You now have the ability to highlight undetected fields, you know, so if it missed that date or that invoice total, you can go and train them all to say, hey, you missed this. Let me uh, highlight it for you and walk through that training. And again, since you're only, you know, training it on a half a dozen files, it's, it's a much easier labeling and training exercise, certainly quicker. And then once you're done, um, it, typically, when you're done with an AI builder model, you would go and use it and reference it in a Power Automate flow that you would build or even uh, kick out to a Power App Canvas and build it into an app. But what we've done is when you initiate this process from Syntex, uh, from a SharePoint library, what we're going to do is we're going to trigger uh, the instantiation of a special Power Automate uh, flow populated with the model all your library information and then kick you back to the library with everything configured and then similarly with uh, the doc understanding models when you're done with that model training you can go ahead and apply it to libraries and then the end result on the far right is that you now have the ability at runtime to upload files and then that will trigger the models to be uh, executed to go and process those files and attempt to classify them and extract metadata from them and one of the things I'll show you in a second, we're going to jump to demo in a second. I just want to give you guys some more framing just so you understand all the various pieces that are at work here is we also do some work to those libraries. So there's a bunch of things that happen with those libraries when you apply these models to them. Uh, we wanted to make sure that users are aware that, hey, there are models <laughs> applied to this library. And at runtime, we give you a notification banner that lets you know that some additional processing is happening. Uh, we also have integrated um, uh, panel detail experience. So you can kind of open up uh, a panel and see what model or models are applied to that library. And then if you are the owner of those models, you can jump directly into an edit experience uh, if you need to work with those models. 
And then real quickly, we're not probably not going to talk much about this more today, but I will call out that first one around taxonomy extractors. Uh, there are some additional metadata capabilities that, you know, with Project Cortex at large, but more specifically with Syntex currently, is the ability to use managed metadata fields when you're training extractors for your document understanding models. This is super cool. I'll show this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that one in a second. And then there's some additional just things that we did in uh, the management of data service itself from an administrative capability. Uh, the two, the term store reports and the new import format is really just to start giving you more flexibility around working with third party uh, taxonomies to build out your own in terms of supporting SCOS format. And then also being giving you some preliminary analytics, which we're going to continue to build on to give you more insights into how your term sets are being used across your, uh, your tenant. And then finally, as a first step in solving the uh, conundrum of our content type syndication sucks in uh, SharePoint Online, we hear you <laughs> and we are fixing it. The first step is with content type push. This is effectively the ability to take an enterprise content type and uh, uh, push it to a hub. So if you have a site designated as a hub, then we're, what we're going to do is we're going to push that content type to that hub, and then it's going to be automatically applied to any new lists or libraries in the associated sites to that hub. I'm going to skip over this. I think you guys, uh, for those of you who are joining, uh, you're probably already you know, on board. I don't need to convince you about the value of metadata and taxonomy and information protection labels, but clearly the benefit that we see here is really just, again, automating all of this really gives you guys that, that flexibility to take advantage of what the AI app models can do in terms of that classification, generating that metadata from the documents so that you can then just really start to you know, improve the quality and consistency of your, you know, your search results, uh, any business process automations, and of course, just consistent compliance governing. So I'll talk a little bit about that one in a second. I don't remember if I have a demo set up for this uh, at the moment. A bunch of my demos in the last week or two have been sort of reset. <laughs> but um, with the MIP sensitivity and retention label, let me just talk about that one super quick. So as many of you know, if you start working with uh, uh, this with uh, the information protection labels, you can define those things and define the classifiers to say, hey, if I have a certain content type, go and stamp it with a particular uh, information protection label. We sort of are accelerating that, if you will, because when you the, the work that we did there was uh, currently with the retention label, we provide the retention label in a document understanding model as a setting. So if that retention label is defined in the Security and Compliance Center, and then it's published to the content center, you can use that, inf that retention label, apply it to a model. And so when that model gets applied to a library, what we do is we just accelerate that application or that stamping of that retention label. So what we'll do is at runtime, when that model runs against that uploaded file and we classify it, then we also will stamp it with that associated retention label. So it's not to displace or replace what the uh, you know information protection you know scanning service does, but it can do it a lot quicker, right? It can do it at, at time of upload, and so there's that benefit of getting that retention label stamped on that file a little bit more quickly. Uh, the sensitivity label worked. Different set of APIs. That work is not quite ready. Uh, we're hoping to ship it out sometime after the new year, um, and but it will work similarly. Where imagine being able to similarly apply a sensitivity label to a model so that it can also be stamped on that file when it gets classified. Okay, we're almost at looking at real software. Um, one last slide, just to kind of, and I think, base. I'll talk with you. I think we have a way to share some of these. Materials. A lot of this stuff has been shared in the tech community. Some of the posts that Seth and Chris and others have shared, and I think even some stuff I've shared on Twitter. But I just wanted to sort of summarize that there's a bunch of pieces that are a part of the Syntex release. Because I know, again, you guys have heard like, wait, Cortex was being shipped, and then it was called Syntex, and then you release Syntex, and not Topics yet. Topics are coming later this year as a part of the Cortex initiative. So right now, the Syntex work it just went live uh, last month. Uh, there are trials available. Uh, just to sort of head off a question that um, has come up, uh, part of the Syntex licensing is you get service credits for form processing if you have 300 or more seats. And that, that essentially is the equivalent of getting the uh, AI Builder um, 
uh, service credit capacity add-on. So you'll get a million uh, credits um, uh, each month. And if you the trial licenses, because by default they only have 25 seats, just be aware that the, those don't come with credits. So if you don't already have credits, you won't be able to try out the form processing experience uh, with the trial license. We are looking to see if there's some ways that we can you know, fix that by giving you like a, a, an amount of credits to try out that form processing experience. But just wanted to uh, address that because that's come up in some of the community threads and discussions in the last couple of weeks. Um, a lot of stuff is available on the product page, including uh, some fantastic uh, documentation uh, that we've put together. A lot of the documentation includes embedded videos that just kind of highlight some of the experience and the things that you can do with uh, Syntex. And then, of course, for uh, uh, our virtual Ignite event back in September, we uh, did a bunch of videos that kind of walk through both the general Syntex uh, value proposition and where it sits in the broader Project Cortex initiative. But then we also did a bunch of drill downs. Myself and uh, my engineering manager even walk, do a whole session where we walk through the whole document understanding uh, model building experience. Uh, I'll touch on some of that. We probably won't have time to walk through all of that in the remaining 15, 20 minutes, but I just wanted to let you guys know that there are a lot of great resources out there. And so if you haven't checked them out, please do. Uh, feedback is always, always welcome. So if there's something that you think is incomplete or incomprehensible or missing, or it's awesome, we'd love to hear all of that feedback so that we can make sure that we're getting you guys the information you need to uh, uh, take advantage of this new product add-on. All right, I'm going to pause for a second because that now I'm going to just jump to some uh, uh, working code and demo stuff. Is there any questions in the chat? Vaso? Yo, hot. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, so um, a few things. You kind of mentioned already the, the licensing. Uh, can you just recap the licensing and costs uh, related on this one? Yes, I'm sorry. You know what? I think I have, I put a licensing slide in here in case this came up. Yeah, okay. So SharePoint Syntax licensing, there's more on the product page, uh, by the way, that's gonna do a much better job of uh, explaining this um, than I do. I build the software, I don't license it, or build the licensing plan, so my apologies if, uh, I'm trying to get more versed on some of the nuances here, but effectively think of SharePoint Syntax as an add-on, okay? So it, I believe that there was talk, maybe, you know, just to keep ourselves honest here, we may have even mentioned at Ignite 2019 that this would probably be like an E3, E5 add-on. Um, I'm sorry, included in E5 and available for E3 or whatever. Uh, it's a little bit more broad than that. Now it's just a general add-on. If you have pretty much any type of SharePoint uh enterprise license or commercial license or education license, you can add the SharePoint Syntax license. You'll see it in the add-on section of your um, uh, Microsoft you know, Admin Center, you know, where you can purchase products and things like that. That's also where the trial will be. Uh, the plan is priced per user. It's $5 per user per month. Um, if you have 300 or more seats, then you also get included in that uh, in that um, uh, purchase, the uh, AI Builder uh, monthly credits of 1 million. And that gets, uh, it doesn't roll, so it gets reset at the beginning of each month. I think that's the standard way that that capacity add-on works. And then it also, there's uh, these content connectors, which I'm not gonna talk about today. Um, happy to do a follow-up with you guys, with people who are more versed in the connectors than I am. But uh, the Syntax licensing does include uh, the ability to use the connectors and index uh, a set number of items. Uh, and that, that amount is pooled uh, by the number of licenses that you have in terms of the number of items that you can index. Uh, let's um, see. Yeah, there's a yeah. good follow up from Mike related on that one. So is the licensing different for the person who's actually teaching versus the end user viewing the library? Not at this time, no, no. Right now we aren't doing any type of nuanced licensing enforcement. Um, uh, that might change in the future, but right now, no. The, uh, depending on the license, the, 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 what the license is going to do is it's going to give you guys the ability to, uh, here, let me just jump back up to this slide real quick. Uh, the administration, what, it is, what it's going to do is it's going to light up the ability to uh, configure syntax, 
uh, so is part of that configuration is you set up a default content center. By the way, content center is a admin site template, so you can make more. Uh, we got feedback from uh, you guys uh, and customers uh, uh, during development that you could imagine what, needing more than one content center, you know, because we see it as both, you know, it's probably going to evolve into something like a modern uh, document center where it could be a destination portal or it could be something where you know uh, you want to set up uh, different models and uh, access to managing those models by department. So the HR content center versus uh, the product marketing versus the operations. So you can create additional content centers uh, through the admin um, uh, SharePoint uh, site creation uh, experience. And then the uh, site, there's a, also, I'll just mention here, you have the ability to uh, set up where the form processing option shows up. So if you wanted to, you can, it can be off for everybody, on for everybody, or you can restrict it to specific sites, almost like an access list. So then any library in that site, they'll get the affordance uh, on that library ribbon to go and create those form processing models. But no, we are not, um, uh, the main uh, filter right now is uh, we do a seat count to determine whether or not you get the additional AI Builder credits. Otherwise, you'll have to have those credits already. Um, and if you have them, then you can obviously use them uh, or you'll have to buy. I think there's a separate license for the AI Builder capacity add-on. Cool. The, the second, there's so many questions now I'm, I'm coming. We'll, we'll follow up with some of this uh, with Sean after the call as well. But second, a big quest, set of questions is around the content type hub and the push on that one. Um, the, the classic questions, will it only apply to new lists which have been associated on the, on the sites which have been associated to a hub? Or will it actually work for all existing lists as well? So currently it only works on new lists and libraries, but since you asked, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you want it to be retroactive and apply to any existing lists and libraries? That is work that we are considering, but we um, are talking to customers. So yeah, if you can chime in on um, the value add of doing that, or would you want the ability to control how that works, that would be helpful to understand those use cases. But yeah, currently content type push only uh, once it's pushed to a hub and, and uh, it's synced down then to an associated site when you join the hub, uh, it will only uh, take effect on newly created lists and libraries. Cool. Now there's yes, yes, yes on that one, but I think you have a demo waiting. So let's not actually, let's jump on the demo and we can come back questions. Okay, so I want to just fly through a bunch of things that are now I just threw a bunch of words at you and some pretty uh, PowerPoint slides and let's just go see what some of this stuff starts to look like. And uh, yeah, I'll, you know what, let me see if I can, uh, since I'm out of PowerPoint, let me, sorry, one second, let me just get out of that so then I can see questions in my other screen and, there. And also, how do we get this to an existing tenant? So how do we get started on the stuff or a um, trial? Oh, the trial. So uh, so the trial, you should, uh, in your existing tenant, you should be able to go into your uh, Microsoft Admin Center where you can see all your licensed products. And I believe, you, you not believe, you have the ability to purchase other products there. Uh, there is, uh, look for syntax. Uh, it, it should be rolled out <laughs> and you should be able to uh, either purchase seats or uh, select a trial. And the trial is going to be a 25 seat uh, trial for 30 days. Cool. Okay. So <clears throat> real quickly, uh, you guys have probably seen some of this, but I'm just going to touch on some of the things that I talked about and just sort of help you connect the dots. Because I think one of the things I was thinking about when I was talking with Vesa about, you know, sharing with you guys kind of like an overview of syntax, I wanted to give you a lot of that framing because I've, I've, in my conversations with the community and threads that I'm seeing, there's still like people are trying to understand how to think about all these pieces and how they work and how they come together and fully acknowledge that, you know, there's some areas where we want to optimize this and we're looking for parity of experience across these things. And, you know, it's a bit, you know, I, I'll be fully transparent with you guys. We do put a bit of that cognitive load on you where, you know, you have to think about, wait a minute, which model type is the best for me? And so let me just kind of reiterate that one again, um, because I think it's also helpful to talk about how do you think about syntax? You know, uh, we, we have a TAP program that we've been working with some customers and one of the things that has been helpful is to help people understand that syntax doesn't, you know, solve the entire business process. <laughs> it, what it's intended to do is uh, help solve pieces of it that then accelerate your productivity or allow you to, you know, optimize 
uh, those business processes so that you know folks can do other things. And so one way that has been to think about it is, hey, if syntax can help me do those things like classifying content consistently in my corpus um, or extracting specific metadata that can then drive business processes, awesome. So then what you want to do is you want to think about what are those uh, business files in my corpus that need that type of attention, that need that type of consistency, that I need to get that entity data from, metadata from, so that I can drive those business processes or ensure that they get properly uh, classified to comply with my uh, governance file plan. And so thinking about that strategically as you go into this, I think helps put what Syntex can do in perspective. And then you can think about, okay, how am I supposed to, you know, then I can focus on the thing where, you know, the the, the big piece of, of syntax in this release is the ability to build these models and apply them uh, to your SharePoint document libraries. So where I, what I have on the screen here is a content center. It's not super jazzy yet. We're doing more things to it, but it's very exciting that uh, this is the place where you build and manage not just your document understanding models, but if you create AI builder form processing models, we're going to roll up a reference to that uh, in the uh, in the central data, and we're building out some analytics so you can start to see like what models are being applied where, and not only that, you know, given what library where they're applied to, how many files are being processed. Because obviously, if you want to make this investment, you want to make sure that a it's being used and b it's doing what you need it to do, you know, and uh, really helping uh, automate those processes so that your folks can do the more interesting work. So in this, uh, what's special about this, uh, this site template is this is the place where these document understanding models are built and where all the model activity and usage is being uh, centralized. And if you have multiple content centers, one of them is the default content center, and that's the one that all the roll-up uh, model activity will occur. Um, so. We have a new uh, model library, which um, is the place where you can create these models, these document understanding models. And you'll see here that there's this one called benefit change notice. And I have, I have another model somewhere else here that I want you guys to see. Ah, I apologize, guys. I have so many windows open. Okay, I am not. I'll, I'll find that window. But uh, when you're in the model, um, this benefit change notice. What this is is this is a, a sample model. So when you create a new content center, uh, you have the you're going to see an affordance to uh, import this model. And what it does is it activates this uh, uh, benefit change notice model. And what's helpful about this is what one of the things we want to do is provide folks with lots of. Uh, uh, opportunities to understand and learn how to uh, build these models and how to train them. And so what this does is when you instantiate this model uh, in your content center, it's a fully functioning model. So it brings in all of the training files. It also brings in a bunch of entity extractors. Those are the things that are going to pull out specific information from the documents and write those to the corresponding uh, SharePoint library columns. And so what you can do is you can use this model as a guide to understand uh, what's happening. And so you can also interact with it. So you can see like, how was the classifier trained? And the classifier uh, training experience, whether you're training the, the model to understand how to classify a benefit change notice from one that isn't, as well as from an extractor, is a pretty similar experience. The difference is that you're looking at the whole document rather than something in the document. So notice that the first step is to label. And so I've brought in a bunch of sample files here and I'm just going to go ahead and label, yes, these are examples. This is an example of a uh, benefit change document. And then if you have one that isn't, you're going to uh, label it as not. And th that negative example is super important. You need one. And this is important because it helps the model. This is where the you, the human, come in to play when you're training the model. And this is also what kind of accelerates and facilitates the building of these models is you know more than the model does. And one of the things you know is you know what a contract is and you know what a contract isn't. And so by giving a negative example, it really helps the model to very quickly understand how to identify, in this case, these benefit change notices. I want to jump back out to an extractor just so you can see what the extractors look like because they're very similar in experience. In this case, these extractors, what they're doing is you're similarly, um, let's go get the date of change, how about that? 
So with the data change, it's very similar. You're labeling the document, but instead of just doing a positive and negative, now what you're doing is you're actually highlighting the thing that you want to extract from this document. So in this case, there's a change note uh, date in this document. And so I want to be able to identify it. And you'll see here, I can go ahead and remove that. But what you do is you just highlight it, and then that saves that label. And then you can move on to the next document. And then once you've labeled a sufficient number of documents, you move on to the training experience. And what's important about the training experience is it's largely driven by helping the model understand, A, how to identify that thing that you've labeled, that entity that you want to extract. And you can do that in one of two ways. You can do that by either giving it some list of values, some types of uh, phrases or things that you know that the model is going to understand. Um, and we have a couple of different explanation types. And so that phrase list you can imagine might be um, something like a list of things that you know that that entity to be. And that helps the model understand not just those words, but even words like that. So it's almost like being very explicit. The other type of one that's super helpful is the pattern uh, explanation. And the pattern explanation is where you're also telling that um, the, the model, training it to understand what type of entity this is. is and this is particularly useful for things like uh, if you've got an address or a phone number or a URL or even in this case a date. So you'll see here that if I look at this date one, what we're doing is we're, uh, we've defined this as a pattern and you'll see that what we're doing is we're identifying all the variations of how a date might appear. And this helps the model understand how to identify this um, uh, date of change that you want to extract. Um, I also want to show you something else that's very cool about this to facilitate that because you're probably going, man, that looks complicated, Sean. Well, we're trying to make it easier for you. And a couple ways that we do that is one, we've given you a bunch of pre-built templates, these pattern uh, and in some cases even some uh, uh, phrase list patterns and I'm sorry, explanation types. And so you see these templates, what they do is they already have all the patterns laid out for you. And so what's nice is you can go ahead and add one of these and then you can go and manipulate it. And even after you manipulate it and go ahead and apply it, um, what, what, let me go ahead and actually save this just so you can see that it's there. And then what I have the ability to do is I can also save this as my own template. So what we're giving you the ability to do is you can make your own explanations uh, from blank. You can make them from one of our pre-built ones to kind of bootstrap, and then you can even save them. And once they're saved, those custom ones are going to show up in that list for auto, other model creators. So you can really start to take advantage of, you know, you reusing these explanations that are uni unique to your business files to, again, accelerate the uh, creation and training of those models. And then once the, the once you do that, there's one other thing. I'm sorry, I wanted to point out here is when you're also building uh, training these these uh, models. Another option is let's go to. A, I want to take you to a different one so you can kind of see what this experience looks like. When you're training a model, you can also train the model to understand how to um, uh, find that entity by the context. So let me show you an example of that. So in this case, I might be looking for something like, uh, I, this is a contract here, and I have something like the company name. And if I go into the training, you'll see here that there's, in this case, I'm, not, I'm doing an explanation called prefix. And what prefix is doing is terms or has expired. Oops, sorry. Um, so you'll notice here that what I'm doing is I'm trying to get the uh, company name out of this contract. And I can actually build an explanation that helps the model understand where to find the company name. And these are very powerful explanations because they're helping the model understand context. And you typically only need like one or two of these to, again, just help the model understand how do I find the thing that you want me to extract, identify and extract. And then, you know, you, you build those and you're off to the races. And once you have those, once you've kind of gone through this training experience on that set of uh, labeled documents, you can finally go into the last experience where it's a test page. And so if you have other files that the model has not seen because you didn't label them, you can now run the model against those, uh, un those unlabeled, unseen files and see how well it does at predicting and, find and finding the, the, the value that you're trying to extract. This is important because it helps you understand, hey, is my model fit and ready? And once it is, then you can go ahead and do things with that model. Oops, I jumped out. Oh, there's that thing where you can build that sample model. Let's jump back into that model for a second. Um, once, you, once you're ready with this model, you've 
trained it to classify uh, these contracts and you've trained the right things you want to extract, then you can go ahead and apply it. And this is where you can select the library and apply it to that library. And then you'll have the option to jump to that library. And so you'll see here that once I've got that model applied to that library, now what it's going to do is it's going to do a bunch of things. It's going to light up this library to let the user know that, hey, there is a model applied to this library and some information about it. It's also going to create a view on that model. So what's really cool about this is the when we create the model, you're creating a content type. And so when you apply that model to a library, what we're doing is we're applying that model and the associated content type to the library and creating a view for that model's content type so that you can then obviously see all the metadata associated with that model as it gets extracted. And so you'll see here that I've got files that I've uploaded. They've been classified as contract notice, and then all this information was extracted from that document. The other thing I want to point out here, too, is there's this thing called the classification date. Actually, let's jump to another library that I have here, just so you can kind of see what this is doing. So I want to also illustrate something else that's happening here. With the classification date, what we do is, I don't know if you guys uh, saw my Ignite 2019 talk, where we had the very earliest first prototype of this thing. And it was a lot of uh, baling wire and duct tape. And, you know, it was, it was literally a lot of magic behind the scenes to make this thing work. And one of the things I wanted to do is illustrate for you guys that, hey, when you extract the metadata, I wanted to trigger a Power Automate flow to go and post something to a Teams channel uh, based on, uh, like in, the, in one case, it was like if the fee amount was over a certain amount of money. And the, the problem with that is, um, you had to build like you had to use the delay trigger. Well, that's really stupid because what if it takes a little bit longer? Then your model, uh, then your flow is never going to run. So what we did was we built a new action. We do a couple things. We built a new action. Uh, I'm sorry. We when the model is classified, what we do is we stamp the file in the library to let you know when it's been classified, and then we have a new action in Power Automate that allows you to uh, build a flow off of that classification date, uh, you know, value. And so what you can do is you can wait until the model is done processing and then kick off the rest of your downstream flow. OK, I'm looking at the time. I want to tell you guys one other thing real quick before I forget it. Um, this contract services one, really important because I think it's, I want to just stress again that a lot of the work that we're doing with Syntax is also uh, associated with the investments that we're making in the managed metadata service. And this contract services field, for example, I've changed this model a few times, but on these two particular records, this is an actual meta med managed metadata field. Um, it, it is here, it's the contract services, and it's got a bunch of values here. And so what's very cool about this is you can actually, in this uh, model, you can train an extractor using a managed metadata field. And then what will happen is when the document, in this case, look at Isaiah Langer, notice that the contract service value is design. Design is one of the um, uh, preferred labels in this term set. And if you go to the document, the actual value that the model extracted was creative. Creative is a synonym of design. So what we'll do is when you run the model against this file, it's going to extract a value and then we're going to match it to the associated term set. And if it matches either the preferred label or the synonym, we're going to write the preferred label into the uh, column. So it's really giving you that ability to not only leverage the automation that the model provides, but ensure consistency by mapping it to a term set. Okay, um, one thing we did not get to touch on today, uh, I knew we might run short on time, but I did just wanna highlight for you guys that uh, with the form processing stuff, it, it works similarly. And there's some interesting work that's also happening with the form processing that that area is continuing to evolve and syntax users will get the benefit of those improvements. So in this case, you'll see that um, there's a new model compose feature or a collection feature. And you can read about it, it the document, the article has been updated. It's a group documents by collections. And what's powerful about this is imagine if you're getting different receipts, I no, sorry, different invoices from different, uh, different uh, shipping companies as, a, as your organization. And instead of having to build two models, if you know that you just want to build, uh, pull the invoice ID and, um, you know, terms of laden uh, from the document, what you can do is you can train a single model against these different types of invoices. 
and extract the same metadata. And then when you do that, you can apply that same model back to the library. So notice I've got here uh, two different types of invoices, PR, Contoso, PO, and then these optical invoices. They both are laid out differently, but I needed the same information from them. And so I was able to essentially group these different training sets into different collections and then train a single model. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility uh, with extending the power of a form processing model. Okay, again, lots of information. I knew this was going to happen. We were gonna run out of time, but I did wanna make sure that you guys know that uh, we are here. We want you to you know, get familiar with this stuff, ask questions, share with us your use cases. There's a lot of information out on um, uh, the product page and also in te the tech community and also on the virtual hub. So please uh, check that material out and let us know if you guys have any questions. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Sean. And, and I'll follow up with you with a few questions which we add on the video notes, uh, which will hopefully go out tomorrow. Uh, so we can add them there because there's quite a few questions going on on the chat. One thing what I want to answer, even though we're two minutes over time, the multilingual support. Uh, obviously, it supports multiple languages, not just English, because that came up with a multiple likes on the chat as well. Yeah, so the multilingual. So right now with form processing, uh, Form processing only supports English. You have a little bit more flexibility with, um, with the document understanding models. That tech is still technically only supporting English at this time, but there is a benefit in the sense that the way that the model does the processing, it's not really looking at words so much as it's looking at tokens. So it's looking at characters and arrangements of those characters. So yeah. some of the preview customers that we've worked with, as long as you are training uh, files on Latin alphabet uh, languages, so things like French and Italian, Spanish, German, the, except you might run into some issues with diacritics and things like that, they should work. But official support is just English only at this time with a plan to support more languages uh, in the coming year. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, clarifying. That one, we got that one in the video as well. And and we do apologize, we didn't have a time to answer all of the questions, but we're trying to follow up on many of them in the in the video notes or the blog post which is about this community call so but yes. thank you sean on that one uh, so the recording is intended to go live uh, in 24 hours in the Microsoft 365 community youtube channel um, so you can easily access that one from there if you want to uh, you can follow the Microsoft 365 dev m365 bmp and obviously at sharepoint as a as a one which we should mention here as well the next Microsoft 365 developer uh, general and developer community call happens this week uh, and then the SharePoint framework week from there, and the next SharePoint monthly community call, which will concentrate actually on SharePoint branding together with Kathy Du and uh, a few other people. So that's on December 8th, uh, so latest on that as well. And we do have a massive amount of other community calls, not gonna mention all of them, um, pick those which are interesting uh, for you, and, and everything is recorded available from the YouTube channels. But thank you, Sean, one more time for today. Thank you everybody for watching. Thank you for the comments and questions and all of the discussions I'm going in the chat. We'll follow up on the questions for sure. But that's awesome. it for now. Yeah, I will definitely check out the chat channel, everybody. Thank you all very much for the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Faisa. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Bye-bye.